and I'd like to welcome you to episode 107 of Chairside Live. Megan is still looking for parking. If you look at a list of Canada's top 10 exports, you'll find things such as minerals, precious metals, aluminum, cars, airplanes. Sneaking in and tied at number 11 is maple syrup, hockey pucks, and poutine. And at number 12, not that surprisingly, Brian Adams. Brian Adams rose to prominence in North America with his album, Cuts Like a Knife, and it ties in exactly to our case of the week, which we've affectionately termed undercuts like a knife. Now, the margins just ain't right. Well, they're actually, they're pretty good. Uh, the impression, when you look at it, I'm not sure if it's going to work. But like a lot of bridge preps that come here through the uh, laboratory, there are some undercuts. Today, we've got a little more high-tech way to help a doctor correct those and move along. So let's go ahead and take a look at the case of the week. Undercuts like a knife. The margins just ain't right. Well, they're actually, they're pretty good. Today's case of the week is a bridge from 18 to 22 on a lower. You can probably tell this is an H&H impression, which we've discussed before uh, on the show. Or um, we, I know we've discussed it, and I hate I, I worry sometimes calling it an H&H &H because the H&H &H people are going to say that wasn't done according to H&H. &H. So I guess I'll say this is a two-step impression where the blue layer set first and then the white uh, layer set separately. Um, and it does always have a kind of a tendency to peel off like that. This is a pretty stiff material here, so it's not peeling off as much as usual. Even after it's been poured, you can tell it's been poured. Um, it's in a double arch, full arch tray. Uh, I like the idea of these, um, but sometimes it's difficult to verify whether or not the patient was in maximum intercuspation, like you can with a quadrant one. But uh, if the bite is correct, or if the doctor sends along the bite, to verify it, these, these trays can work. They're usually a little stiffer than regular plastic trays. In fact, as I try to compress this one, I really can't compress it at all. That's because it's got a stiff material in it and just a bigger thickness of plastic. So um, the doctor sent this in and we poured it up and uh, did what we always do, which is put it into the scanner. This is now the modern way that, uh, that crowns are made here at the lab. Everything's done CAD CAM and it really offers us and the doctors some uh, ability to see things that we couldn't see before. There we go. Now we can see all the teeth. And you can see that it looks like we have some undercut issues. Um, tooth number 22 looks fine. Uh, you can see the green dots that uh, connotate the margin line. You can see them all the way around here. So there's really no undercuts here that we need to worry about. You know, there might be a little one on the facial of that, but we'll look later. You can see we definitely have an undercut here. The green balls are partially gone on the margin. And then on tooth number 18, you can't see them at all as we come around here. And so this is our, our look along the path of insertion. As we take a look from some other sides, we can see on the facial, this is looking um, from the buckle, we've got a little undercut here, which it kind of looked like when we look from the top down, but that's not, in, that's not significant. As you might imagine with an undercut here, um, we design the bridge as though that undercut wasn't there. And then there's just some extra cement space there. We can't design the zirconia to go into that undercut, but we can leave it alone. There's going to be some extra cement there. That should be fine, but it looks like we've got a lot of undercut here and it comes all the way down to the margin. And that's a problem because we can't, if we do over here on the margin, what we did over here by staying away from it, we're going to have an open margin. You can just see a shadow uh, on tooth number 18 on the mesial. And this is from uh, the lingual view, and you can see on the molar we've got a lot of undercut here. Again, we can see the distal of that tooth, and the lingual is clean on the cuspid, as you might expect. That would be difficult to undercut, probably. And uh, as we continue to look for more of a distal aspect, we can see there is a little here uh, on the cuspid, a lot on the bicuspid, and none on the molar. And as we look again, the mesial of that molar is just all in shadow, and we can just see a little wrap around here in that same spot on the buckle that we saw before. And so looking at it, um, you know, we're able to determine that this is not going, to, not going to draw. And so we send this to the dentist. We can take a stone model that we poured up and mark these areas, but send these as well because three-dimensionally it gives uh, a good look at where we need some extra reduction. It's going to be namely on the distal uh, of the bicuspid and on the mesial of the molar, and this tooth is pretty clean. So we send those off to the doctor, and uh, we get another impression back. Actually, we cut this off. Uh, as part of after it had been scanned. And you can see that, um, again, um, you know, pretty good. As you'll see on, when we look at the stone model, they're nice preps. You know, the doctor's got 
uh, a good set of hands. And uh, again, kind of the impression, you know, wants to peel away. I mean, I don't know. He obviously must be pretty, uh, he or she must be successful with this technique or they wouldn't um, continue to do it. Actually, I, I forgot to look up uh, this doctor's remake rate before we, <laughs> before we came in. Um, you know, if, you, if the remake rate was 50%, you would say, well, they're, they're not that successful doing it. If it was 6% or 7 or 8, anywhere between 6 and 10, you'd say, well, that's fine. Zero, we get suspicious too because um, things just all, things go wrong a couple times out of 100. And so with a 6% remake rate for every 100 crowns you get from the lab, um, 94 of them would fit and six might have to be reshaded or have a contact added or something like that. So we're not after a 0% remake rate. We're not after a 50% either. Six to 10% is healthy. Uh, and it's acknowledgement that as dentists, we're human beings working on human beings who like to move and the fabrication of the restorations is being done in part by machines, but finished by humans who also make mistakes. And that's why, you know, 6% shows that you've got a good quality control filter as well. We can again see all the green here. Not much needed to be done to the cuspid. Uh, we can see green here. Remember that was cut off halfway. So there's definitely been some reduction on the distal as we indicated. And ooh me, look at this. This we could see none of the margin here on the molar. And from the insertion direction, now it's looking pretty good. As we look from the facial, we've got that same undercut that we had before. We have a little more now here than we had before. And we definitely still have some on the distal, but it doesn't go all the way it doesn't look like to the uh, occlusal surface, and that's the reason why that green uh, is now uh, visible, or this is a channel. We'll see as we look you know, a little bit later. That might be almost kind of a groove prep then that would allow us to see that. And you can see that there's definitely been a lot of reduction. If you recall before, it was actually slanted this direction, and now this has been slanted back. And so that actually looks pretty good. As we look from the lingual, uh, on the molar, that big spot's been reduced a lot. Still some on the bicuspid, though. And you, again, you can see this kind of curvature right here. Cuspid's still good. And then as we kind of look um, a little more from the mesial on this angle, uh, we know that's there. See a little on the mesial here, and the molar looks good. And as we swing to the distal, yeah, again, it's, it's this one. It's this tooth that's uh, the concern for us. Uh, because the software thinks the margin is actually up here because of that little groove. So let's look at the model for that and see if what we can see as we look at the model. Um, we don't look at the model all that much anymore. We tend to scan it and look at the scan uh, and then go to the model if necessary. And here we're going to go to the model because we're just trying to make a judgment call. So as we adjust the light, you can see this a little better now. It was a little bright in the beginning, but you can see again that this does still look like an undercut as the tip of the perioprobe slides down that distal surface. I can feel it as I go back and forth, but you can see that you can't see the margin even though we can see it here. If we tilt the path of insertion so that we can see down that wall and see the lingual, it looks like it's gonna be okay except now we got it on the facial. We had a little more on the facial than we did before, and I can't, if I rotate to the lingual to get the facial, I lose the lingual. And so on, on cases like this where it looks close but we can't tell, uh, that's where our 3D printers come in. And so before asking the doctor to do anything else, I mean the first time we knew it wasn't gonna work, but here you can see that is slanted to the distal, but we're not sure if it's gonna work, and so this is where our 3D printers come in. And this is another piece of technology that we now have that we never had in the good old days. And this very stiff, solid resin that we use is a great way to check whether or not we have draw. And so we go ahead and scan that. As you saw, you already saw some of the screen grabs from that. And now we design the restoration and then we're gonna print it on our 3D printer and try this on. And you can see it goes all the way down. You can even see through it you can see how we've got good inclination on the cuspid and you can see how this one now is headed towards the distal and you can see all that preparation that was done on the mesial of the molar. And any time, it's pretty much 100% successful, any time we can get this on and off of here without breaking dyes and it will go on and off, even if we do have some undercuts on a particular tooth like this bicuspid, we know that this bridge is gonna be okay and this bridge uh, will in fact draw. And so once we're able to print this, we're, we know we can go ahead and mill it now in zirconia and go to uh, all the trouble of uh, making the final bridge because we know it will draw. And again, like I said, you know, pretty decent preps, pretty nice preps. So this is somebody who's got 
good hand control. This is just something very difficult to see in the mouth. It's super easy to look at it from here. So if you were to rip your patient's cheek off, you'd get a good look at it. But that's why we love being able to send these screen grabs to dentists so they can see exactly what's going on and where it needs to be reduced a little bit more and where the undercuts are because this is the kind of view that's hard to get. Even if you take an occlusal mirror and put it in the patient's mouth over that arch and look at it, close one eye, this is still hard to see. But this kind of bird's eye view and view from every angle, dentists are finding very, very useful for education about what they could have done differently in that case or in this kind of case where it needed to be reprepped to make the uh, bridge be able to go into place, they can actually use these as a roadmap of where to reduce. And with the soft tissue in place too, we wanna to just have a little bit of spring here as I push down onto it, and we do. That just assures that we have a nice solid contact uh, between the ponic and the soft tissue itself. So by printing up this resin bridge, and I suppose if the dentist wanted, although there's, I don't know why a dentist would want to do this, but you know, if you wanted, you could actually try this in the mouth. But if we're willing to go, if we're willing to go to the trouble of making the zirconia one and sending it to you, uh, you're better off trying that one in because if that one fits, you can cement it. If it doesn't fit, you can take a new impression. If this resin one did fit, you'd still have to, you know, put the temps back on and wait for the new one. But um, this would be a good way to be able to verify it. And that's how we verify it now uh, in the laboratory when we have any question. Um, we can now make one of these trials. We can make this much quickly, much more easier than if we had to cast a full metal one out of this. So we're able to do kind of a trial a bridge or trial prosthesis here at the lab. Make sure it's going to work. Call the doctor and let him know full speed ahead. And then mill this out of zirconia, center it, stain it, glaze it, and send it back to the doctor with the knowledge that it will, in fact, drop into place. Time for this week's Chairside Live one-on-one. -on -one. This week, I had the opportunity to sit down with Dr. David Little, who practices just outside San Antonio, Texas, and talk to him about his general dental practice that he has and what he's been able to do with specialties within his own building. David has what I think could be a model for the GP practice of the future when you consider that most solo practitioners are going to have to be competing with uh, corporate dentistry, DSOs, organizations that are staffed with three, maybe four dentists. They could be open early mornings, weekends, evenings. Uh, it begins to become clear that we need to perhaps be a little more competitive and maybe keep more procedures in-house. David has done this to a great effect, and I wanted to sit down with him and let him share some of his thoughts on how he set up his practice with our viewers. Hope you enjoy. I'm here with my good friend, uh, Dr. David Little from uh, outside of San Antonio, Texas. David, I can't remember exactly what city you're in, but I remember it has an interesting name. What city are you in? I am actually in China Grove, Texas, which is uh, where the Doobie Brothers made uh, a sleepy little town around San Antonio famous. I didn't realize, um, I knew it had an interesting name, but I didn't remember uh, exactly what it was. When I heard that song, I used to think that it was about heroin. You know, I just thought it was like a type of heroin because they were musicians, or maybe it was the name of a girl. But it's actually about your town? It is, and it's actually, it was, it's a town just outside of San Antonio, and back then, they could get outside the city limits, and we had uh, horse racing and uh, gambling and some other things. So uh, it drew a lot of people out here. I bet. That's funny. I, do, I remember they mentioned samurai in the song, which of course are Japanese, uh, not not Chinese, but I guess Japan Grove doesn't roll off the tongue the same way as China Grove. How big of a town is China Grove? Well, actually, China Grove now is part of San Antonio, so San Antonio's grown beyond it, but technically it's always stayed a city within itself, and there's probably only about 1,200 actual people that still live there. And how many dentists are there in that community? Well, the good news is there's only one, so and, uh, <laughs> and it's you, and it's me. But there, there's several all, all around it. And because I was kind of a little bit away from things, I set up an office that I started bringing all the specialists into my practice, and mainly I did it just to serve the population because they didn't want to drive somewhere. So um, I got all the residents that I was working with at the school when I was teaching there. I still am teaching there, but um, I got them to come provide those services on Fridays and Saturdays, and that turned into we built a building where half of the office is a complete specialty wing. So we have you know kind of everything under one roof. So you have all, including like a pedodontist. 
the only one we don't have is a pedodontist, but my associate is our pedodontist. She's she's really good with kids, and so we haven't found the need for that. But uh, we have all the other specialties. Are they still there just a couple days a week, or are they actually there every day that you guys? Um, are there? We have a different one there every day. So it works out well because we can do joint consultations. If we have to, we can bring them all together in one time. But it just really works well for patient care. Now, I'm going to guess that because you've you know, taken the time to put together that group, the convenience factor must be really high. So when you see a patient with super subgingival margins on a lower molar and it needs a new crown, um, you're probably much more willing to send that patient to have crown lengthening surgery because it's right there in the same building and essentially income for yourself, but you have the skill of a specialist doing the procedure. That's correct. So it, it really works out well. And, and the other thing that's happened from this too is, you know, our specialists have been great at educating us and teaching us. And so some of those procedures now, they've really taken the time to mentor us so that we've actually now, you know, we, we can do those procedures as well. Um, having that mentor right in the, in the same office is great. And you're right, patients like dealing with one staff, not having to go to another office. And uh, that's been a really good thing as well. Do you feel like this is something that um, every dentist could do, or do you think that um, because you knew the residents and you were kind of in a smaller city that this was something you were forced to do? Or because it sounds like a, a great setup, and I wonder if, if more dentists uh, would be able to do this and, uh, and have all these specialties kind of in-house. Well, you know, I'd like to say I was really smart and did this as a good business model, but the truth is I did it to really serve my patients because in my situation, there wasn't a good option. They had to drive 20 miles to go to a specialist. So uh, I'm not sure it would work when you had all the specialists really easily and, and accessible to you. But I also think that, you know, convenience is a big thing. And I think that patients really like this model. And, you know, we're even seeing this in some of the big group practices now are starting to kind of set up the same type of situation. So uh, it, it's been a real benefit for us. And, and I think in the right situations, it's a win-win for everybody. Now, the big thing you're going to run into, and, of course, my specialists were the same way, oh, my God, I can't do that because nobody referred to me now because they think right. oh, it's just you. And what's happened in our situation, honestly, is that, you know, I've gone to the dentist around my area and said, look, I'm not going to steal your patients, and they're not going to take somebody and refer them somewhere else. That would be bad for them. So I'd see it as a service, you know, let them use it. And you know what, honestly, they have referrals from all over now. So it's been a great, you know, situation for that. And also, you know, like, for example, my oral surgeon is an MD as well. And it's opened up a lot of medical referrals that we didn't even think about. So it, it's been a good thing in, in several ways. And uh, plus, you know what, I just enjoy having the interaction, you know, and, and being around. And, and it allows us also do, to do a lot bigger cases. We do a lot of, uh, you know, full mouth extractions, uh, immediate implant placement. Um, and so that's why, you know, implants are a big part of what we do. But we can do everything right there, and it really makes it nice. Right, and, and I would guess you're able to do sedation cases having the oral surgeon there as well. And that's a really big thing. And so we have, you know, in my office, since we have a periodontist and oral surgeon, um, we can have whatever sedation the patient wants. One of my associates, actually, she's certified in anesthesia as well. So we can offer everything from just, you know, pill form to IV sedation to, uh, you know, and, and we also do a lot of patients just with nitrous and, and Nucom, a non-narcotic sedation thing. So we can offer a variety of things. And, you know, again, it's kind of what the patient wants. And it seems to me more and more they're actually going to the little bit less sedation if they can. Right. It just it feels to me the way you describe it like um, like the GP practice of the future, or at least the GP practice for the future that's going to be able to compete well with corporate dentistry, you know, who's going to do a lot of these same things and be open Saturday and Sunday and really, you know, uh, try to focus on convenience for the patient and, and you're doing the same thing. You know, I think that uh, when we met for the first time, I think it was back in uh, around 2001 maybe because we were both kind of involved with the very first generation of zirconia, uh, which was Zircon that's from right. Dentsply, which was a – uh, zirconia substructure with ceramic fused uh, to the outside of it. It's um, you remember those days, and you remember Ab doing those restorations. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, that was, you know, that was the beginning of you know, look where we are today. And you know, you guys obviously are the leaders in in what's happening in that industry. And so, uh, 
yeah, it's it's great to see that come to fruition. Well, it never at the time occurred to any of us that the right thing to do might be to take all the porcelain off the coping and make the whole crown out of the coping because the copings were white, like snow white, yeah. and all we had to cover it up with enough porcelain so that it wasn't showing through. It was like a B negative three shade, and so it really never occurred to anybody. And then we, you know, you kind of work your way through those, and and really it was you know Iva Clark taking the ceramic off of you know IPS Eris and turning it into Emacs that kind of got people thinking well maybe we don't need ceramics on these restorations to still you know have them have them look good so yeah monolithic restorations are now the majority of what we do at the lab talk about how you kind of got involved and where you where you use them and find them to be helpful for you well, and like you said, I mean, we started way back, and you know, I remember it was a challenge for the technicians to try to block out that whiteness, you know, of it. And then, you know, I think the other thing you and I talked about too was, oh, that the core is so hard, it'll never work, you know. And so my big concern was the wear. And then when we started looking at the studies of how polished, you know, zirconia uh, is very kind. And the big thing for me is that, you know, the prep is so much less than right. what we have to do, and so. To me, you know, I think that's where we've really gone. And, and here's the other thing, too. All of us dentists, you know, if we can put a gold crown, that's probably our first choice. And if we look in our own mouth, that's probably what we have. But you know what? We know that we tell patients, you know, I can do that or I can do something that's just as strong but looks good. You know which one they're going to go with. And so, you know, now I have the confidence to, to prescribe that and, and really have great solutions for that. And I've actually even... Um, I do a lot of implants. That's what I do mostly, and I'm doing you know doing the Brexer crown on top of uh, most of my implant abutments today mm -hmm. because you know again you've got all the benefits of of what we need and not having to worry about it fracture and and those things is you know that's a big benefit. Yeah, I want to show you. Uh, I just finally placed my first implant um, a couple of years ago. And I was um, terrified uh, to do it, and um, and I want to show you why. Uh, I was terrified uh, to do it. I'm going to pull up a uh, an X-ray here, and uh, can you see that X-ray, David? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh -huh. So we got three Im implants there, and that one on the mesial, the two in the back are osteo integrated, and the one on the mesial is uh, odonto integrated, <laughs> and uh, they put it right into the root of that tooth, and uh, I guess it's still there today. I'm not exactly sure, but that's the kind of thing that had me terrified. Uh, of getting into implants, whether or not it was um, uh, doing something like that, putting an implant into a root, putting it into a sinus or the mandibular canal. Uh, I wasn't willing to place my first one until surgical guides came out. And then when I finally started placing them with surgical guides, to me it was like, this is easier than a three unit bridge. You know, this is easier than molar endo. Tell me, you said you do mostly implants now. How did you get you started and get the courage up to do that first one? Because we still aren't seeing that many GPs doing it on their own, surgically anyway. Yeah, and just, you know, all the same reasons that you said, you know, one of the things that I had, you know, benefiting me was I had an oral surgeon at periodontist kind of looking over my shoulder. And one of the things that I think is the key to, and I think general dentists should be placing implants. And I think, you know, if nothing else, we should be educated on everything that, that implants can do for patients. And one thing that's great today is that technology has changed where I can do a CBCT scan and I can decide right then I don't want to do that one. You know, that this as far as, yes, I want to do it, you can also say, no, I don't. And plus, me having an eye for implants has opened up more, you know, business for the oral surgeons and the, and the periodontists. And I think as a general practitioner, you know, getting the information, taking a CBCT scan, uh, using a surgical guide, you know, in, in those situations, and seeing the end before you start, I think that's the key. And like you said, you know, once you do all the homework and plan it, the execution of it is not that difficult. We do a lot of things more difficult than that. To me, endo is more difficult than that, or third molar extractions are more difficult. So, uh, and I think it's a better treatment for the patient. And you know, let's face it, 80% of implants are single teeth. That's where general dentists live and breathe. And so, 80% of it, we should be doing that versus a three-unit bridge. Now, I'm not saying bridges are bad. If you have two broken-down teeth, I think that's a great solution. Um, but if you have two virgin teeth, I think really that's the only care that should be given. And uh, I think with the proper education, I think we can can place those implants and do a great service for patients.
Yeah, if a patient comes in to see you and they've got a, let's say they've got an old PFM bridge um, from 18 to 20, por porcelain's fractured off, and it's got uh, you know some recurrent decay at the margin, um, what's the kind of conversation you'll have with uh, a patient about replacing that bridge as is versus two separate crowns with an implant? And, you know, the biggest thing that, that I talked to him about is the preservation of bone. That's the one big thing, and you can actually show them that the bone has gone away since they had that first bridge done. And that also can lead to some of the perio problems and some of the recurrent decay things that can go on. So in an ideal world, I would love to be able to put the implant there to maintain the bone, which will affect the health of those other teeth as well. Um, and but also being real, saying, you know, you got seven, ten years out of this bridge, and we could do another one to do that. Um, however, I tell them usually if I'm going to replace something, I want to replace it better than I could, you know, the first time. And so uh, the other thing I talked to him about, and this is a simple thing, is how did you like flossing your bridge? And most of them say, I hate it. And, and I'll say, well, that's another big advantage is that we can make individual teeth where you don't have to do that. And also, you know, again, I tell them, look, the strength of those teeth by themselves is better when you, than when you time together. And so long term, you're going to be better off from that situation. And, you know, yeah, what I found, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say what I found when I ask them, how do you like flossing that bridge? And they say, I hate it. That's just a lie. <laughs> they never floss the bridge because when we delivered the bridge three years ago, we gave them three floss threaders to use. And now three years later, when we ask if they need it anymore, they say, no, I'm good. I'm like, really? You made three of those last three years? You put them in the dishwasher? What, what exactly are you doing to keep these in such pristine condition? And we take off the bridge, and like you see, you know, it's just completely irritated because they're not. So you're right about the bone. But certainly, and you're right about the perio condition too, that if they want to keep those other two teeth, they're better off having three separate teeth. Yeah, I totally agree. And what about the fee difference, David, between, you don't have to give me actual numbers, but I'm just wondering kind of in a ratio of... Uh, well, what and here, like. here's kind of what I tell patients. You know, when I first started doing this, it was four times more to do the implant. Right. You know, and it, it was a big difference. And today, I'm going to tell you that it's still a slightly higher investment, but long term, it's a much better investment. And that's how I present it. And I also tell them, here's the reality. That bridge is going to last seven to 10 years on average. If you really take care of it, it'll last longer. But if you're 40 years old, think about over your lifetime, how many times you're going to have to replace that. And we also know that when we replace it because of decay, we might have to do root canals. And so your, your most predictable investment is to do an implant. And that's most of the time that's what people go with. I actually like to um, uh, congratulate people sometimes. So when I see somebody who's missing a lower first molar and it's been gone for 15 years, I'll look at a guy and I'll say, Mark, congratulations. You, I, all, I know inside my head that he just procrastinated because he's a male. But I'll say, congratulations, you made a really wise decision. Uh, even though I wanted to do that bridge, you kept saying no because you knew there was something better. And it's here <laughs> today, Mark. We can put an implant there to replace it. And we don't have to grind down those other two teeth. So sometimes I actually like to frame it. I don't do it quite that glibly, but I like to frame it as, hey, you know what? I'm glad that's still there and that bridge never got done by me or anyone else because now we have a solution, which is what the patient always wanted. They always said, well, why do you have to do two other teeth? Why is it three teeth? Why can't you just glue a tooth onto my gums? And it's like, well, we, we don't have that kind of crazy glue. But now essentially we do with an, with an implant and a crown. And uh, David, I'm wondering what your thoughts would be. Um, on a, on a concept of a modern extraction. Let's say starting in the year 2020, we have a new concept of a modern extraction, and that would be every time we remove a human root, we're always going to replace it when we can with a titanium one, regardless of whether or not the patient's sure they want a crown on top, a crown and abutment on it right now or they might down the road. How, how radical of an idea is that, or do you think it makes sense to you? You know, I think it makes sense, and actually, I don't think it's as radical as you think, and, you know, 2020 is not that far away, and I think maybe even before that, um, you know, the technology keeps getting better, and, you know, anytime we can preserve what's there, that's, a, that's the best thing, and if you give that patient that option, because you and I both know, too, sometimes patients come in, they don't do anything, you don't see them for a long time, they come back and say, now I'm ready for that implant, and now they don't have enough bone to do it, and right. so, you know, that's why I promote at least 
grafting the socket so that you prevent that 25% in the first year so that you give them a chance to be able to, to do that. We've also seen, you know, over the years, I remember we used to wait a year before we put anything in, right, 30 years ago. Now, you know, we realize that immediate placement um, is a reality, and what you were talking about is not far-fetched, and, and it's being done. I have a saying, if it's being done, it's probably possible, and I think that's something we're going to see, you know, more, more and more of. Well, David, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you being gener enough, generous enough to share some time with our Chairside Live viewers. And I always love getting a chance to talk to you because, again, that practice model that you set up there, I really think is the model of the future. And GPs would be really well set up to compete with corporate dentistry if they provide that type of structure and convenience and confidence that you guys are doing there. So congratulations on what you've done in uh, China Grove, and I hope to see you out on the road uh, in the not-too-distant future. And the next time you see his name giving an implant lecture or maybe a hands-on course at your state meeting, do yourself a favor and go check him out. Well, that'll wrap it up for this edition of Chairside Live. On behalf of myself, the CSL crew, and everybody here at the laboratory, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry. Undercuts like a knife. The margins just ain't right.